Good morning, Rob. It's time for another unscripted, unrehearsed answers without effects scene. Sora, first we need to do some real talk for a sec. Hey, so it's Edgar from the future here. I need to interrupt Edgar from the past because I want to make sure I word this bit just right. Real talk is, I would like to make these Q&As a space free of video request questions. So could I please ask everyone to refrain from leaving questions of the form, will you make a video about X? I realize I covered this a little bit in the last Q&A, but I want to explain my rationale here. I love world building in Conlang, and if you're watching this video, chances are you love world building in Conlang, and if you're anything like me, you love talking about world building and Conlang. And this, in part, is why I wanted to make this Q&A, a place where we could all talk more about world building and Conlang. Problem is, video request style questions don't lend themselves to conversation. They just yield yes or no answers. Will you make a video about biology? Yes. When? I don't know. Will you make a video about culture? Yes. When? I don't know. So instead of asking those questions, could I maybe invite you to ask more specific questions? So instead of asking, are you going to make a video about religion? Ask something like, what's your thoughts on polytheism versus monotheism? The latter right there, that's a thing we could talk about. And you know, there can be a back and forth in comments, ideas can be hashed around, which may even play into a future video. And I think that's a much healthier environment than everyone just asking, when are you gonna make whatever? Now, most of you aren't gonna see this video. Why? Because YouTube is too busy off in the corner dry humping its algorithm to actually deliver videos to subscribers. So I'm going to need you watching to help me moderate this a little bit. If you happen to be in comments and you see someone leave a video request style question for the Q&A, uh, very politely point them towards this video and hopefully we can all then engender a, a spirit of discourse. I would love that um, and I hope that's not too much to ask or I'm not being to mean when I request this. All right, cool, so I've taken up too much of your time, so let me hand you back to past Edgar for the Q&A proper. What about deep sea currents? So, great question. I didn't talk about deep sea currents at all in the last video, so let's talk a little bit about it here. When we talk about deep sea currents, we invariably talk about a thing called thermohaline circulation, or thermohaline circulation. I don't know how it's pronounced. I've only ever seen it written down. And essentially, it's a big giant current that loops its way throughout all the oceans and joins everything up. You might know it as the global ocean conveyor belt. Parts of this conveyor belt consist of surface driven wind currents and others are like deep ocean currents. And it's a massively important thing. Like A, it transports water around the planet. That's really important. It delivers heat to the poles, so it moderates temperature. It governs the rate at which deep water is brought up to the surface. It affects CO2 concentration in the atmosphere and a whole host of other things. But in a world building context, I actually think it's really meaningless. Like at maximum, you may need to know that it exists and maybe know that it does these three or four things that it does. But we can't really map it with any degree of confidence because in order to do so, we would need a detailed map of the ocean floor. And even if you have that, it's not entirely intuitive how you get from that to a global ocean conveyor belt. Like this is the topography of Earth's sea floor and this is the thermohaline circulation. It's hard to see how you get from one to the other. So basically it's a complex thing and it's too complex to kind of worry about in a world building setting beyond kind of it exists. And you'll see this bear out in other tutorials online. Go search world building ocean currents. You'll find two opposing camps. One that just ignore thermohaline circulation altogether. I'm part of this camp. And the others acknowledge that it exists, but they just go, oh yeah, so there's this big loopy thing on earth. Uh, so just on your map there, draw a big loopy thing. And uh, I suppose just randomly pick where it pops it up to the surface and where it goes deep sea. And hey presto, thermohaline circulation done. Yay realism. And like, that's deeply unsatisfactory to me because it's completely arbitrary. You know, to the point where, why are we even talking about it? Now, that said, up until yesterday, I was of the opinion that it was important for deep sea civilizations, say. Like, say you got an Atlantis. Maybe it should be located on a particularly strong part of the thermohaline circulation. So, so it's almost like Atlantis has easy access to a highway, like a network of undersea roads, and they could join up other deep sea civilizations, etc., etc. But I did a bit of digging. It turns out that in the deep sea, this circulation moves at like fractions of a centimeter per second, which is like slower than swimming. 
and like also slower than any sort of submersible would go. So it's not so much as a highway as kind of like a, an ill-defined mountain trail. I'd imagine they'd probably rise up to the first like half kilometer of the ocean to avail of those relatively fast wind-driven so ocean currents and ride them around the earth and drop down to the next place when they have to. And you can keep following this. The more you think about it, the more that thermohaline circulation is super, 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 super important, but it operates at a level that's not really important to storytelling. Wind-driven currents, you know, they dictate biomes and they act as like shipping routes and the location of like fishing hotspots. These are all like have immediate storytelling implications. Thermohaline circulation, not so much. Although I could be wrong, feel free to prove me wrong. But boy, that got a bit long-winded, sorry. Next question. What happens to the currents over the continents on a water world with continents just below the surface? Uh, so TLDR, in the last video, I advocated for creating a water world that had continents just below sea level. So you get the aesthetic of a water world, but with all the intricate ocean currents of a terrestrial planet. But I didn't address this question, and it, it's a good one. The short of it is that it's messy, don't worry about it, tides will kind of come into play. Like, the patterns that shelf currents make on Earth are dictated by things like location, time of day, season, tidal currents, as mentioned earlier, subtidal currents, all these complex things going on. If you're interested, there's a link in the description, go check it out. But again, the ocean currents are kind of the important thing in terms of like shipping, exploration, biome placement. Like they're, it's a real heavy hitter in terms of world building. What happens on the continental shelf? Not so much. Would the same principles apply to other liquids? As in, if a world's oceans were not made of liquid water, but instead liquid methane, liquid ammonia, liquid hydrogen chloride, that sort of thing. I don't know for sure, but my gut is telling me that the same principles would apply, as in the same ocean currents would manifest themselves. Because ultimately, all that's happening here is that wind is moving liquid along. No matter what the liquid, it's still going to be moved along. Same currents apply. I'd imagine the only difference would be, say, the viscosity of the liquid. Like if it's very sticky, maybe the currents won't be very powerful. But then you can just amp up the wind speed and that would compensate. So I don't think it's a hell of a lot of difference. Put it this way. If you put a map in front of me and said, those oceans are in fact made of liquid methane, here are the currents. I'd be like, yeah, sure. Suspension of disbelief, engaged. Extremely pedantic, but you made a common error. Cool waters are not generically nutrient rich. I wouldn't expect an area to support a large fishery just because a cold current is present. Excellent fisheries typically occur where there is upwelling bringing nutrients up from the deep ocean, which, as a byproduct, causes the water to be cold. I mean, you're not wrong. It's quite pedantic, but like, I do think it's a good point and uh, it allows me to talk about upwelling, which is kind of cool. So thank you for the question, but I will push back on the concept that it was an error. It would be an error if I was a science educator, but I'm not a science educator. I'm not here to teach you how oceans work. I'm here to teach you how to make fantasy maps. And the two are very different and require differing levels of complexity. Sometimes I think it's best to hide away the mechanics or maybe even bend the mechanics slightly to be able to facilitate quick and easy instructions in terms of mapping. Whether or not you think it was the correct call to make in this instance is up for debate. And honestly, I'm 50-50 on it. Maybe I should have elaborated on upwelling and Ekman transport. Pin on that, we'll talk about in a second. But that's the call I made. I don't know. So yeah, upwelling, like you say, it's where uh, deep ocean water gets drawn up to the surface. Deep water tends to be very nutrient rich, so nutrients are brought up to the surface and that leads to increased productivity, so lots of fish and um, that sort of thing. In general, you get coastal upwelling, which is like what it says. Uh, you get equatorial upwelling and you also get this thing called the island mass effect, which basically means that there's going to be upwelling around islands. Um, Tasmania is a good example of uh, productivity around an island. Links in the description to sources on that if you're interested. And all of this upwelling is driven by a thing called Ekman Transport. And I strongly consider each and every one of you to go check this out. It's like super fascinating. And Ekman Transport, in a nutshell, basically states that for a given wind direction, water on a spherical rotating planet will have a net flow 90 degrees relative to that wind, which is kind of mind-bending and really counterintuitive, but it's a logical extension of the Coriolis effect. And I'm not going to get into it, go read the Wikipedia article, it's class. What's also kind of cool is read the Wikipedia article and then apply this knowledge of this 90 degree net flow to my previous video and have a look at how things all still work 
I think that as well is really interesting. I've been wondering about the distribution of stars in an area. What would be the next step for someone following your 1000 stars tutorial as far as where all the stars are relative to each other? So in the Milky Way, the average distance between stars is about five light years. That figure is reduced at the core and increased at the outer rim, if you will, uh, because stellar density decreases as you move away from the core. It, stellar density also decreases as you move away from the plane of the galaxy. Um, so there's that. In terms of like location, like orientation relative to one another, it's random. I'm open to being wrong, but I don't think there's anything that determines where they are really. Anyways, you could make a like pretty massive space empire and still have it occupy a chunk of space that is homogenous in terms of distribution of stars. Because remember, galaxies are huge. So whilst your empire might take up a big distance relative to the whole on the spectrum of like decreasing densities, it's homogenous. Unless you're like the Borg, which just, you know, they have them take over like the, a quarter of the galaxy, which, okay, they're the Borg and it kind of makes it okay. But I've always, that's always been a pet peeve of mine with um, Star Trek. They're giant uh, empires that just make the whole galaxy seem really tiny. That's a story for another day, it's a, it's a digression. Yeah, five light years and orientation, doesn't matter. Do I have to do anything special to justify a planet as having high levels of volcanism? A la Mustafar. Think about it. Was there any time in the Earth's history where the Earth resembled Mustafar? Uh, answer, yes. So maybe your planet is super young and has literally just formed. I say just, I mean just in the geological sense. And it's still cooling and its surface is still molten. That's Mustafar. Also, maybe it's just undergone its equivalent to our late heavy bombardment. Essentially, it was pelted by meteors. The whole crust becomes like semi-molten again. Very Mustafar. So yeah, uh, I'm gonna do one more. I'm gonna do one more. Favorite non-educational YouTuber. Meme review.